A warm welcome to everyone this morning. You are all are welcome with great uh, joy to the house of God once again. It's good to see some friends. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. And Peter Baird will be taking today's service. We really give glory to God for bringing him here to bless us with his word and to lead us in worship. He is a retired uh, a pastor. He has uh, served the Lord faithfully uh, uh, for many years and we are happy to welcome him here this morning. Uh, to mention uh, Peter Salmons has been inducted uh, as pastor at the Tillery Street Evangelical Church. Uh, Gary and Jill uh, will be representing us here this morning. Let us remember them in our thoughts and prayers and, 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 and pray that God will build his church uh, there at Artillery, Artillery Street. We have our service here this evening. Daniel Savage will be bringing God's word to us and you're invited to join us again and to uh, invite friends and families to come and hear God's word. Okay, so um, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning. This is a first for me. Um, uh, uh, well, in this church, although in the building, I've been here many times in times gone by, long, long times gone by. I've been uh, uh, worshipping here with others, uh, not permanently, but on, on a visitor basis. And um, so uh, now it's great to see it all open and, uh, and, uh, and all of you coming to worship God together here. And, um, and I'm really pleased to be invited to be a part of your worship here this morning. So let's pray together. But before we do, um, I just want to say that um, uh, all of us have had a journey here. Some have walked, some have come by car, but we've all been doing things. We've been quite busy uh, since we got up this morning after breakfast, doing things, getting ready and, and so on. And we just need to calm our spirits a little bit, don't we? We're coming into the presence of God. We can't just breeze in, can we? Because he's so special. So we're going to be quiet for a moment or two so that we can have a little quiet prayer um, uh, asking God to uh, come in and um, uh, into our lives and into our hearts and into our experience together in worship and, uh, and uh, just to, come in, to commit ourselves to that. So let's just be quiet for a moment or two before I lead you in a, uh, a prayer of worship. Father God, we thank you for these moments when we can come close to you and seek the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit in our experience right now. We thank you that we can switch off from all the activities that have occupied us and to come into your presence with singleness of mind with the determination that we're here to worship, to bring you our love and our thanksgiving. And we gladly do that, Father God. We worship you now, particularly because of Jesus. For Jesus has been into our world. He has died and risen again, and now he is our saviour. He is our Lord. And we just want to say, Father God, that there are no words or thoughts that we could express that would adequately say how we want to feel, how, what we want to say about our Lord Jesus. And we just want to say to you, Father God, thank you so much for sending Jesus into our world in all its chaos and all its, um, uh, and all its uh, evil and sinfulness and sending him here so that he could redeem us and buy us back 
so that he could restore us to himself and to his family. Thank you, Father God. We worship you, especially for Jesus. We also worship you, Father, because uh, today we shall be opening uh, again once more uh, the miracle which is the Holy Scriptures. And we worship you, Father God, that you have um, overseen the passage in the passage of time, the preservation of the Holy Scriptures through through so much history and today we are delighted and thrilled that we can just open its pages and read read what it is you're saying to us mm -hmm. that which affects our our lives and our families and our experience and thank you father god for your holy word mm -hmm. we pray your bless it to us in jesus name mm -hmm. amen amen <coughs> We're going to sing our first hymn now, which is 111 in, in the, the hymn book. I don't know about you, but in recent days I've been thinking so much about the amazing wonder it is that in the world in which we live, which is so full of chaos, more of that uh, a little bit later, so full of evil and war and, and uh, so many different things, that um, we can come to God with these words. And ask God to forgive us. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind, in purer lives. Thy service find in deeper reverence praise. Let's stand to sing. Jews of quietness 
hands till all of striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace, the beauty of thy peace. We through the hopes of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire, speak through the earthquake, wind and fog, or oh, still small voice of calm, or oh, still small voice of calm. Well now, it's so great to see children. Uh, in the service this morning and I've got a special time for you today um, and I, uh, I hope you'll enjoy and benefit from the things that I'm going to say and do for you here this morning and afterwards I've got a special song for us all to sing which is specially for you as well. So um, I think I would like some help so uh, I'm going to come down here for this Right now, um, let, can we have all the children up the front here? Can, would you like to all come out? That's it, right, okay. Now, my, when I was, uh, uh, when my, that's lovely, come and join me, that's fine, yes. What is your name? Uh, are you and Aisha as well? Very pleased to meet you. Yeah, she's lovely, good, and what is your name? Oh, me, pleased to meet you as well. Lovely, yeah. Your name? Ah, oh, lovely, nice to see you. And what is your name? Joshua, that's a good name. Yeah, oh, bless you. Lovely, yeah. Yes, it's lovely. <coughs> What's your name? Deborah. Yeah, it's another good name, isn't it? Yeah. And your name? <coughs> what is your name? Oh, lovely. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So, welcome uh, to this little children's spot. Um, now, when I, when I, had, I had a little boy. He's, he's a man now, and he's grown up, and he's got his own family. But when he was a little boy, he just loved pretending. Do you like pretending? You like pretending things? Yes, most children like pretending things. So we're going to do a bit of pretending this morning. And um, in my pocket here, I have my handkerchief. Um, now, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to help, I want to, I want to help you to be able to pretend something. Um, so here's my handkerchief, and we're going to pretend that this is the world. Now that's going to be a bit difficult, because we all know, don't we, that the world is very big and it's very round, like a big ball, isn't it? But it's huge, absolutely enormous, and a hanky doesn't really do much to remind us about it, does it? But that's what we're going to try and do. Imagine that this is the world, all right? In my pocket here, I've got a box of matches. You look about the oldest one here, so would you like to take that and take one match out from inside that box? Would you do that? That's fine, good, good, okay. That's it, lovely. You hold on to that match and give me the box back. Lovely. Show me the others what you've got there, because it's a big one, isn't it? Quite a big one. Yes, it is, that's right. Okay, so we're gonna pretend, now this is gonna be even more difficult, we're gonna pretend that that match is Jesus. All right. This is a bit difficult, isn't it? So this is the world, and that's Jesus, all right? So uh, we're, we're going to lift Jesus up high. Should we do that? That's it. Lift him up as high as you can. That's it. Lift Jesus up high. Because he's so very, very special, isn't he? Mm. Well, he was always high anyway. Uh, even before we got to know him, he was very high. He was up in heaven a long, long way. We don't even know where it is, but we know that it is where Jesus lives and where God lives. And so, uh, I'm going to tell you about a time when um, <coughs> Jesus came down from being high up in heaven and came down into our world. Well done, you did that beautifully. And there he is, he's in our world now. And, um, and in our world he came and he did some amazing things. 
Now, you probably know all about this because you probably know what's in your Bible. And you know that Jesus healed people who were very sick. Maybe sometimes you know that he, he actually made people come, to, come alive again when they'd been dead. Mm. And that's, that's amazing, isn't it? He did some amazing things. He made blind people to see. He made lame people to walk. He made deaf people so they could hear. I've got hearing aids and I wouldn't mind a bit of that. So, um, so that's what he came to earth for. He came to do all those amazing things for people. Just imagine that we were here when Jesus was here. And we could see all those things happening. Wow, that would be something, wouldn't it? That could happen. But you see, he's not here anymore now. He's gone back to heaven again. But he was in our world. And, um, well, they didn't treat him very well, did they? Do you know about this? And so he's in our world, um, and he's, um, he's a bit... He's very unhappy because in our world, he, um, he got hurt very badly. People didn't believe in him, they didn't trust him. And then later on, some terrible people did some awful things to him. They, they put a crown on his head that was made of thorns and it really hurt. And then they whipped him and they... They did some horrible things to him and then they led him out onto a hill and they nailed him on a cross. You know all about this, don't you? I'm sure you do. And in the cross, on the cross, Jesus gave his life. You know, sometimes when we're in church, I expect you've been for, for these, we have a thing called communion, a special service. Do you have it here? Yeah, I thought you would. And in this special service, we say to God, um, we thank you for Jesus and for his broken body. And we break bread, don't we? And we say that's about the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Well, here's Jesus in our world, so would you like to, to do that? Just break it. Just a minute, just a minute. Just, yeah, that's it. There you are now, just break it. Oh, wow, I heard that now. Did you hear it? Did you hear that? Do you like to break it again? <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That really, really broken. And Jesus went to the cross and his body was broken because he came so that we could be forgiven. Isn't that amazing? That's what he came for. And do you know what? He's not there anymore. He's not on the cross. He's not even in the grave. Because now he's alive again. And, oh, there, look, look, he's, he's, up, he's completely alive again now. So, it was broken, wasn't it? He did break. You mean his body was broken, but now it's not broken anymore. And now, in heaven, he waits for us to go there. When we trust him, when we love him, we can go there to be with him. And so, we remember that this morning. Then we did a bit of pretending. We pretended my hanky was the world. We pretended this was Jesus. But now we can see that Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And he did it because he loves us so much. Isn't that amazing that Jesus loved us so much that he would do that? So we're going to sing a little song together now. You can go back to your seats while we sing it. And we're going to sing a song which says, I'm special because Jesus, because God has loved me. He gave the best thing that he had to save me. His own son, Jesus, crucified and hurt to take the blame for all the bad things I have done. So let's, shall we stand and sing together? Uh, 325 it is in the book. 325, I'm special because God has loved me. Hmm. Because God has loved me, for he gave the best thing that he had to save me. His 
own son Jesus crucified to take the blame for all the bad things I have done. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. I know I don't deserve anything. Help me feel your love right now to deep, deep in my heart that I'm your special friend. Special because God has loved me. He gave the best thing that he had to save me. His own son Jesus crucified to take the blame for all the bad things I have done. Thank you Jesus, thank you Lord for loving me so much I don't deserve anything help me feel your love right now to know deep in my heart that I'm your special friend thank you Jesus thank you Lord for loving me so much I know I don't deserve anything help me feel your love right now to know deep in my heart that I'm your special friend and okay please take your seats isn't that great to be a special friend of Jesus Amen. yes indeed well now we're going to pray again now because um, it's really important that we pray to God about all the things that are happening in our world not good things most of them there are some good things and for those we need to say thank you to God but we need to pray also for those involved in some of the bad things that are happening in our world don't we some of the, some of the people are caught up in wars and conflicts and um, people who got into really bad habits and um, gone away from Jesus and uh, all of those sort of things so we're going to pray uh, a prayer of what we call intercession we're going to pray to God on behalf of other people and um, I think it might be a good idea like we did for our first prayer for me just to be quiet for a few moments because you might have special things in your uh, experience that you want to um, lift up to God and I don't know about those things so um, let's uh, spend a little time praying to God for the things that you know about and the people that you know about that need you to pray for them and need God's help and if you want to to pray out loud so that we can join you in your prayer please do feel free to do that uh, and then, uh, then I'll lead you in a prayer again a little later. So a little quiet time of intercession, praying for people that we know that need God. <clears throat> for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you that your word teaches us that. Mm -hmm. So we pray now um, with him for mm -hmm. our world. I want to pray particularly for the ongoing situation in Ukraine. Yes. Um, that you would continue to have your way there, but you would ultimately you would bring justice in that situation. Amen. Uh, we pray for all the people who are suffering hardship, uh, grieving for loss of family, um, and those who are finding it hard to even survive day to day. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know their situations mm -hmm. and I want to lift the whole country before you mm -hmm. um, that you might 
intervene and do works of power mm. in the lives of those people mm. and in that country. Yes. For Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Father, your word said that we should pray for all those who are in authority, that we may lead a peaceable life. But we pray for the leaders in this nation, we pray for the king, we pray for the prime minister. We pray for your wisdom, we pray for your guidance in these times of challenges. Lord, with the psalmist, we will lift up our eyes onto the hills and we will declare that our help can only come from you. Lord, we are praying for your intervention in the situation. That Christ will be seen in the midst of the crisis. Our great need is to be reconciled to God. Father, we need you more than ever in the history of this nation. We need to turn to you repentance. Yes. We need to call upon your name so that we can be saved. Mm. So that we will see your intervention mm. in this nation, in families, mm. in homes, oh God. Mm. In the lives of men, women, and children mm. that are perishing. Yes, Lord. The suicidal rates are so high. Mm. Many are checking out of this world so fast because they feel empty. Because they have so many questions but there is no answer. Because they've sought help from everywhere else except you, O oh God. Mm. The enemy has come in to steal, to kill, and destroy, O oh God. We are praying in your mercy mm. that you turn this nation back to yourself, O oh God. Mm. That people will begin to seek God. Mm. People will begin to name the name of God. Mm. People will begin to turn to Him. And people will begin to call upon His name so that they can be saved, mm. O oh God. Yes. So they can, they can experience that joy that comes from His salvation. Mm -hmm. So they can experience His smile upon their lives and upon their families and their homes, mm -hmm. oh God. Mm -hmm. We pray that in your mercy, you hear these prayers for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. We ask. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Father, we just thank you for what we've learned this morning already, that uh, in a fallen world, that you sent your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. uh, to die for each and every one of us, Father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this morning as we gather before you, Lord, we just want to remember those of our own families uh, and, uh, and our relations, Lord, who do not know you yet as Lord and Saviour. We know that we live in a world which darkens the soul and the mind and the heart, Lord, and takes them far away from you. Mm -hmm. But we thank you that you came down to be broken, to be put mm -hmm. upon that cross, for all men, mm. for all time. Mm. And we just ask and pray, Lord, that you will work by the power of your Holy Spirit mm. in the lives of our loved ones who do not know you yet, mm. that you will bring them ever closer to you, Lord, we pray. Mm. Amen. 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 And we pray, Lord Jesus, for the people who are blind to, to the things of God. <clears throat> now come to know the true and living God and be saved. Mm. And come to know Jesus, the way, the truth, and life, and be saved. For greater love have no man than this than a man laid down his life for his friends. And how you love us to right to the very end. The one is the King of Kings, the Lord of the Lord. Pray your wonderful name. Hallelujah. Our Saviour and our God. Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, we pray especially this morning for our families and also our churches, Lord. We yes. know that um, it seems as if the Christian church is asleep at this point in time, Lord. There's so much, such a powerful message we've got to take mm, to the world. Yes. This saving power to change people's lives, mm. Lord. And we find that the church, as a, as a, as a unity, is split, mm. Lord. We, we, we just pray for all the churches that uh, what truth they have to, mm. to, to, to preach this, to take it out into the streets, to make it mm. available to people, to try and find through your spirit, Lord, a way through to hearts, mm. Lord. The way that affects the mind, but also takes it to the heart, that really people bite on this truth. Because it's, it's a two-edged sword. It's powerful. It's supernatural, Lord. Help us. Help us as a people. Help us as individuals. 
to understand what you want us to do, Lord. Mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to work for everyone to do. No matter yes. how small or how large, mm -hmm. we can all contribute something. Yes. Help us through your spirit mm -hmm. to take this message, this powerful message, mm -hmm. which is dynamite mm -hmm. when it reaches certain people. Oh, Lord, help us. Mm -hmm. We ask this in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. 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 You pray God, for this. Your God Almighty, I don't normally speak a lady, Lord, as you know. But there's a lot on my heart, Lord. And mm -hmm. I pray for all these churches, like these small ones, Lord, mm -hmm. who preach week after week, Lord. Mm -hmm. And the joy they get when they lead people to the Lord. Yes. And I'm especially going to pray now for that man out the front and his wife, Margaret, people and Margaret. But when years gone by, spent days, months, and even years nurturing me mm -hmm. in my house, out my house. Mm -hmm. Peter had the joy of leading me to the Lord in 1983. Mm -hmm. But unknown to him, alas, mm -hmm. I fell away after a few years. And I've only been back to the Lord since this August. Mm -hmm. Last year, August. And a coincidence, I was led back to the Lord in the same church mm -hmm. that Peter led me to the Lord many years ago. So I just thank you for all those who preach the word mm -hmm. and for all the souls that hear the word. Mm -hmm. And even if they fall away, mm -hmm. remember that they never leave you, mm -hmm. never forsake you. Yes. As I've proven that in my life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. To pray for the service going on in Abbeygate this morning, Father, and, and your blessing upon the man who will take the lead in that uh, place, uh, that uh, you will guide him and direct him and uh, surround him with your love and your wisdom, and that that place may grow and uh, many will come to know the Lord Jesus through his ministry. Amen. Bless him, we pray, and all of the folk who uh, worship there. So we bring all of our prayers to you now, Lord, and commend them to you. And thank you for the way in which you always listen to our prayers and answer them in accordance with your own holy will. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you for your prayer, Robert. That was um, moving for me. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to uh, sing one more time before we read the Holy Scriptures together. We're going to sing 244, uh, very appropriately, after all that we've been doing and saying here this morning so far. How great is our God! How great is His name! Let's like sing the song, this song, 245. Let's like sing it through twice. It's just a one verse song. How great is our God. is his name how great is his love forever the same he rolled back the waters of the mighty red sea and he says I'll never leave you your trust in me. How great is our God, how great is his name, how great is his love, forever the same. He rolled back the waters of the mighty Red Sea, and he says, I'll never leave you, 
put your trust in me. In our um, scripture reading this morning, which we're going to have in just a few moments, we're going to home in on a time when, after the passing of old Jacob in the Old Testament, his sons, the brothers of Joseph, they concocted a story that they would tell Joseph in order to save their own lives. Now, you probably recognize where I'm coming from here because you probably know the story of Joseph. It was quite a deceitful act, wasn't it? But they were pleasantly surprised at the response of their brother, who seemed to act without any malice whatsoever, and the words he used form the basis for what I believe is God's message for us this morning here. So if you've got a Bible and you want to follow it, I'm going to be reading it from Genesis chapter 50 and verses 15 to 21. Genesis chapter 50, 5 verses 15 to 21. And this is what the Lord's word says. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Well, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what I what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when the message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers came and threw themselves down before him, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. <clears throat> Older ones will probably remember that in days gone by, preachers would, would sometimes begin their sermons with the words, Well, my text for today is... And then they would preach from that particular text. Well, I've got a subject rather than a text. But I do have a key verse that we've just read there. I'm, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, the eternal purposes of God, about purpose that, ha that has and is and will come out of chaos. Mm. And so this verse that I want to use as a sort of basis is the la one of the last verses I read to you from that <coughs> scripture. You intended to harm me, he said to the brothers, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Purpose out of chaos, the eternal purposes of God. Joseph, well, he's among the more well-known of Bible characters, isn't he? Partly because the story of Joseph in the scriptures takes up at least ten chapters. So we've got quite a lot of facts, haven't we? Culminating in the one that we have read this morning. And the last... And, and these ten chapters uh, about the life of Joseph and his brothers and his father and all the other happenings, 
they form a continuous and rather intriguing narrative, which, as we all know, has been retold numerous times in books and films and plays and musicals. I doubt if there are many who've never heard of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat or sung along uh, to the song, Any Dream Will Do. <laughs> the purposes of God, where he chooses to reveal them to us, his creatures, are best seen by standing back to see the big picture. And when we do that with the life story of Joseph and his family, we actually do see something of the eternal purposes of God in that situation. It appears rather like a giant jigsaw where God has been reaching down to put all the places, all the pieces rather, in their correct order over many, many years. We also see the purposes of God in retrospect, looking back where, uh, when all the pieces are in place. And then, and then we gain a little understanding about why he did something, or why he allowed something, or why he prevented something. Because then, to a limited extent, we see how the individual parts of the story relate to all the other parts around it, and all of them contribute to the whole picture. Of course, that's a very simplistic view, isn't it? And we know that, for example, the, the life story of Joseph... Uh, is only a complete story when we isolate it from all of the other events and stories uh, if, of history that are recorded in the Holy Scriptures. And also, uh, we need to be aware that the um, story of God's purpose with the human race remains incomplete. <coughs> well, it does until the end of time. When Jesus returns, and we're looking forward to that, aren't we? What I'm saying is that the death of Joseph, which immediately follows the passage that we read, and also concludes uh, the, uh, the book of Genesis, it's only the last piece of the jigsaw of that particularly small part of God's dealings with the human race. You see, the purposes of God for the world and its inhabitants begins not just at the point of creation, but way, way back the other side of that into what is mysterious, mysteriously referred to as eternity past. The other side of our beginning. And of course, also, it goes on and on beyond the end of time. The purposes of God are that great, that enormous. And you know that's a truth that we all ought to always have in the back of our minds. But it's one of enormous, enormous and incalculative proportions. Because you see our human minds are unable to conceive of anything that vast. We may not be able to understand these things with the finite, limited um, human intellect, but we do believe them through faith, and that's very important. If we do not believe them, then in our minds we try to make God our size. Lots of people do that, don't they? And then, of course, he's not really God at all, is he? Of course, God, the eternal creator, is aware, totally aware of these human limitations. And he graciously allows us to see a little bit of his purpose revealed through parts of the, uh, of, of the whole picture. And that's what we're doing right here this morning. We're going to see a little part of the whole picture and see how God's purpose is revealed to us through it. I suppose all of us can look back over the years of our own relatively short 
lives and recall various milestones on our journey. Defining moments, watersheds, life-changing experiences. And for the Christian, born again by the grace of God into the new life of his spiritual and eternal family, the most significant of all of these moments would be the time when we came to know Jesus. But of course there are large numbers of others along that way as well, aren't there? Although perhaps of, of much less importance, none of them are less significant in the big picture. Among them may be your education, your graduation, your career path, your marriage, your first home, your retirement, uh, and we could go on. Also, among these, you would count experiences that are far less positive. And we all have those too, don't we? Things like the breakdown of a close relationship, serious accident, illness, redundancy, severe financial problems, and for many of us, the onset and the experience of the third age. Now, in highlighting these suggested features of our journey through life, we have stood back from the immediate, haven't we, to view the bigger picture, as though we were using a wide-angle lens on our, on our camera. But now, let's put on the zoom lens and focus on much smaller and seemingly insignificant events and see that without them many of the major experiences wouldn't have happened. I can, for example, look back over my life and see a 40-year span of time when I was engaged in a Christian design and print ministry. That's what God called me to. But looking closer into the detail of that, I can see what seemed like a chance conversation in a dinner queue. And it changed the course of my career, and it brought me in line with a future plan that God had for my life in a Christian ministry spanning, as I've said, something like 40 years. I wonder if you can see the point I'm making. It was so with Joseph. He, like us all, had his milestones along his journey, didn't he? Milestone moments. Here are some of them. His father gave him a colourful coat. He might, have not, he might not have seen that as very insignificant at the time, but it became a big matter. His brothers were tempted by jealousy. Potiphar bought him as a slave. He suffered false accusations. We could go on, couldn't we? Highlighting events in this man's life. Because they're all there in the scriptures for us. But the point of all this is that through all the vicissitudes of life, all the seemingly random, perhaps almost insignificant moments, God was working out his great purpose. And creating a far, far bigger picture one that is, very, that is too vast for mortal eyes to see. Some things he causes to happen. Some things which we were regretful for, he allows to happen. Some things he prevents from happening. But you know, there is not a single moment in the life of any of us that isn't part of his eternal and perfect knowledge. And throughout all of the chaos of our earthly lives, God works out his divine purpose. Isn't that amazing? Cynics would have a field day with this one, wouldn't they? To them it would seem far too, uh, uh, too, too far-fetched, uh, almost ridiculous. But that's only because they're seeing it all with human eyes. Considering it only from our very tiny place in time and with our very limited intellect. 
Christians have a God who is way above and beyond all of these in, in these restrictions. Mm. And so we act falsely when we attempt to draw him down from his pinnacle of divine, eternal, creative power and authority into our tiny experience of everyday life where we feel somehow that we can contain him. The really amazing truth is that out of and even in spite of the chaos of our ongoing individual lives, our church life, our community life, our national, even our international lives, God brings about his eternal purpose. This is my message. This fact is clearly illustrated to us as we see the ways and the byways travelled by this man, Joseph. How the purposes of God for his people was worked through all of these things. God had promised Abraham when he was in Canaan, a land that was quite foreign to him, that he would give this land to a nation yet to be born. A nation that would emanate from the miraculous birth of his own son, Isaac. And God never fails to keep his promise. And generations later, Joshua led that very nation into that very land by the almighty hand of God. But trace backwards from that point. Trace backwards from Joshua to Moses, God's great leader, born into the Hebrew race at a time when they were enslaved by an, an evil Egyptian pharaoh. Continue on backwards through many generations and many changes of those Egyptian kings. Keep going back to a time when that nation was just a single family. And consider how that family ever came to be in Egypt. And what have you? Well, you have the story of Joseph. The end of which we've read this morning. Is that coincidence? Oh, no. This is the big picture of a God who is totally in control of his purposes. Need to be encouraged by this, don't we? Not a God who lurches from one crisis to another, trying to make sense of each experience that life turns up. But an all-knowing God, from whom there is no hidden thing. Can I say that again? An all-knowing God, from whom there is no hidden thing. A creator God whose plan and purpose conceived before the creation of the universe takes in all the chaotic situations, large and small, that are brought about because of a disobedient, rebellious and unfaithful race called humanity. Now just in case you haven't noticed the chaos along the way, Allow me to take you back one more generation still to the family that Joseph was born into. You'll know the story. That son, Abraham, that, that son of Abraham that I mentioned earlier, uh, Isaac, well, he married Rebekah, didn't he? And they had twin sons, and they were called Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the quiet, home-loving one. And his mother, Rebecca, loved him more than she loved his twin brother. Esau, well now he was an outdoor man, always out in the country, hunting for wild game that would provide food for his family. And his father loved him more than his brother, Jacob. And as, as you all well know, that is called favouritism. And it's a highly volatile family practice. Perhaps you even know of a family where this practice is destroying any possibility of a strong family bond. 
Now, because Esau was the first one to appear at birth, they were twins, remember, that made him the eldest one, and by the custom of the day, he should have inherited the birthright. But he cared little for it. He lived for the moment. And there was one moment when he came home very hungry, and Jacob, seeing his chance, said that he could have some of the stew that he'd just cooked in return for his birthright. Now, that would fly right in the face of the father's plans, and it would greatly upset him. Later, of course, when old Jacob, who was by then blind, said that he was going to give his blessing to his favourite son, and his firstborn Esau, when he came home from the hunting, his wife Rebecca, knowing this, schemed a dishonest way for Jacob, her favourite, to receive the blessing before the other son, the other brother returned. And of course, as we all know, the ruse worked. And when Esau came home and discovered the plot, it was too late. He'd sold his birthright. And now he was deprived of his blessing. He was so angry that, uh, that he said that after their dad had died, he was going to kill his brother. And Jacob, the brother was so scared that with further connivance by his mother, he ran away to his uncle Laban's farm where he stayed for 20 years. And he married uh, Uncle Laban's two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And he never saw his mum again. So in one family, we have favouritism, jealousy, unhappiness, carelessness, scheming, dishonesty, deceit, disappointment, anger, fear, a badly scarred marriage and a runaway son. Now I think you all agree that that's pretty chaotic. And into this chaotic family, as the son of Jacob, Joseph was born. But the antics of his grandparents and their other son were not the only chaotic features. There was chaos too in the mix of family relationships. Now, this might make you smile a little. Jacob, as we have said, married the two daughters of his uncle Laban. They were his cousins, uh, being the, the daughters of his uncle, who incidentally was the son of his father's cousin, whose name was Bethuel. Now it gets awfully confusing because Jacob's mother, Rebecca, was also his second cousin because she was the daughter of his father's cousin. So as Jacob's mother, who was also his second cousin, had a brother Laban, that makes Laban, as I've said, Jacob's uncle. Are you with me? I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it? However, Laban wasn't just his uncle. He was also his second cousin because he was the brother of Jacob's other second cousin, whose name, as we know, was Rebecca. But she was his mother. This means that Rebecca is Jacob's mother, being the wife of his father, but she's also his second cousin because she's the daughter of his father's cousin, and she's also his auntie because she's the sister of Uncle Laban. Now, I thought that simple explanation was useful, just to emphasise how chaotic, chaotic was the lifestyle and the interrelationship of Jacob's forebears. There's a great deal of truth in the known fact that we often inherit large chunks of our personality from our parents and those close to us. So, because Jacob had observed the favouritism of his father for his brother Esau, and because he himself had clearly seen his mother's favouritism, you would think, wouldn't you, that he would learn not to repeat that fault in his family. But did he? No. 
he went right ahead and exercised it all over again by singling out his then youngest son Joseph to the intense dismay and anger of the rest of the brothers and giving him the special privileges along with that special coat of many colours. And out of that came more jealousy, more bitterness, more anger, more scheming, more deceit, lying and great sorrow. Joseph was sold into slavery. A grieving father was hoodwinked into believing that his favourite son had been killed by a wild animal. Well, as you know, that lying and that evil and that jealousy and deceit came back to visit them much, much later when these unsuspecting brothers went up to Egypt to buy grain and there was famine in Canaan. So, all that was by way of illustration. Let's get back to our theme. As we stand back from all of this and with the benefit uh, of recorded, uh, of the record preserved in Holy Scripture, we see emerging out of all this chaos a God who simply, because of who he is, missed not one of those details. And yet, out of and in spite of all that chaos, he worked his divine purpose and revealed his immense love for his people. Wow! Isn't that amazing? And after Jacob's death, and the long days of mourning had passed, 40 of them, it occurred to the brothers that this would be Joseph's moment of sweet revenge. And now we're back to that passage that we read, aren't we? And they appeared to contrive a message that they said had come from their late father, in which he was supposed to have asked Joseph to deal leniently with them. Now, if I'm right in my interpretation that the message was contrived, then it is clearly an attempt to get them out of what they saw was an entrapment. In fact, they were scared as trap rabbits. But they didn't need to be, did they? Because at last, Joseph had learned. And he'd learned what we this morning are also learning. And he said to them, don't be afraid. What a lovely thing for him to say to them. Don't be afraid. Am I on the pl in the place of God? You intended to harm me, he said. But God intended it for good. The eternal purpose of God worked out through chaos. The saving of many lives. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. You see, Joseph speaks with the heart of God. It seems to me that God says something similar in regard to the cross of the Lord Jesus. He says, don't be afraid. You have meant to harm me. You have crucified my son. But I meant it for good. To accomplish the saving of many lives. This is God's work. And this morning we've seen a glimpse of the eternal purposes of God for humanity being worked out in spite of the efforts of the enemy to thwart them. Purpose out of and in spite of human chaos. Chaos that continues to reveal the weakness of rebellious humanity to this very day. Chaos that our own nation is currently embroiled in so this is God's message for us today in order to reassure us to comfort us and to empower us there is one detail not one tiny detail of all the chaotic mess that in his, adva uh, his vast eternal foreknowledge God does not know about and right here, in the centre of his purpose, is the cross and the resurrection of his eternal son, Jesus. Right in the centre of his entire purpose for mankind. 
the amazing demonstration of his unfathomable love for you and I in 2022. The eternal purpose of God is complete in eternity. But here, in time and space, they are being revealed as God decides and we gain the ongoing revelation as we walk with him, close to him, day by day. Amen. 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 We're going to sing uh, the song, Ascribe Greatness to Our God the Rock. I thought that was just about the most um, appropriate song that I could find for this, uh, to, to close these thoughts with. Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock, a God of faithfulness, without injustice, good and upright as he. Let's stand to sing. It might be good if we could to sing it through twice. Sorry, number 40. Beg your pardon. Number 40. 40. <coughs> Greatness to our God the Rock His work is perfect And all His ways are just Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock His work is perfect And all His ways are just God of faithfulness and without injustice, free and upright is He, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, good and upright is He. Greatness to our God the Rock His work is perfect And all His ways are just Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock His work is perfect And all His ways are just Without injustice, good and upright is He, a God of faithfulness, and without injustice, good and upright is He. God the Rock, His work is perfect, and all His ways are just. Ascribe greatness to our God the Rock, His work is perfect, and all His ways are just. Without injustice, good and upright is He, a God of faithfulness, and without injustice, good and upright is He. Now to Him who is able to keep you and me from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore 
Amen. 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 The Lord bless you all. Amen.